everyone. Welcome to another cool Plants Live. I'm Juliana and I'm tonight's Plants hostess. This Plants Live is also the kickoff of another Plants Week full with cool and bizarre promotions. Fortunately, I don't have to do this Plants Live alone. Tony from Not Another Jungle is here with us to answer your questions, but also to share his tips and tricks and experiences regarding plants. Before I include Tony, I'd like to reveal that it's really good to keep watching. Not only for Tony's super tips, but also we're curious to see if you see the subtle hints to Plants Week action. However, we're already happy to share a special discount code. The discount code will give you 15% off from everything in our shop tonight only. Pretty great, right? The discount code is PLANTSLIFE15. And now I can't wait to bring Tony in anymore. Um, we're very honored and happy that he wanted to come all the way from the UK to host his plants live with us. We think he'd definitely make you happy with his tips and experiences. And in the process, he will um, answer some questions that were sent in beforehand and also answer some questions that you guys ask tonight. So leave your comments, um, leave your questions in the comments and who knows, maybe yours will come up later. So Tony, join us. Hey, it's so Hi. great to be here. Yes, once again, welcome to Plants and thanks for wanting to be here. Oh, it's great. Yeah, um, I think it would be good if you um, start by briefly introducing yourself yeah. in case there are still people who don't know you yet. Absolutely. So my name's Tony from Not Another Jungle. I've run that account for two years, but I've had a lifelong passion for plants. And my passion has evolved over time, and now my real obsession are rare, more unusual plants, and especially things like these Monstera right here. I've got to say, I have been wowed. Come to plants.com. Your greenhouses are insane. I'm so jealous. Everything I do seems so small now <laughs> compared yeah. to what you guys do. And um, good. I mean, the selection of plants you've got, I just didn't think was possible on the sort of beautiful scale and and vigor that the plants grow at. I'm yeah. unbelievably impressed. Thanks, thanks a lot. Really cool. Um, now I'm going to leave you alone. So you can do your thing and have fun, Tony. Great, and of thanks. Course, have fun, viewers. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully I am as fun as our last host. I can't promise you that, but I can promise you loads of tips about plants. And we're going to start with these two really special plants, which I'm so happy can now be shared with a greater audience because of plants.com. So we've got two Monstera here, and after these two Monstera, we're gonna introduce you to a brand new plant that has been launched by plants.com that they miraculously created themselves with a freak accident, which has created something so unbelievably beautiful that I definitely want to have in my own collection. So the two plants here, many of you may know, uh, but some people might not have even heard of these before, and you shouldn't be scared because they're rare, because both of these plants can be cared for super easily. Um, and you don't have to have a specialist setup either, even though you may see these things online. And of course, if you do have specialist setups, they're going to grow better. But don't be put off. I've grown both of these in a regular home environment. So first of all, I think we have to start with Monstera Oblica Peruvian form. So Monstera Oblica isn't one plant. Uh, Monstera oblica is actually a complex of many different plants, but this is the most famous and the one that actually had its own hashtag, um, it's never oblica, because uh, just a couple of years ago, it was incredibly rare and difficult to come by on the market. Um, but this is the real deal, <laughs> thankfully, because I've got to talk about it. And I've grown this a lot at home, I've propagated it, and I've also experimented with it in lots of different situations. So I've learned what works, and what doesn't work. So first of all, with Monstera oblica, it is one of the smallest forms of Monstera that is around. So it's great to have in a home because you can get it to mature and possibly even flower at a quite small size. So I think that is such a huge positive for a Monstera because as we know, things like Adansonii and Monstera deliciosa on that side take up a lot of space and you will pretty much never get them to flower in your house, but this one you can. So with regards to its care, 
They do grow better at high humidity, but I have also tried growing one of these just in my home. But the real key with this is to give it stability. So temperature wise, regular home environment down to about 10 degrees is perfect. But the key is to get it straight on a pole because they do something um, and produce something called a stolon, which you might be able to see here. This is how this one was first um, created. Um, you might have heard them referred to as runners before. Um, but basically, this is how the, the plant either propagates itself or escapes a situation it doesn't like. So you want to avoid it doing that because it reduces the leaf size. It doesn't put its energy into creating bigger, more beautiful leaves. It puts its energy into producing more of itself. So by doing a really stable atmosphere, you stop that happening. So with regards to light, this is lower light than a lot of other Monstera. It doesn't mind a little bit of direct sun in the morning or in the evening, but you really do not want to put it into direct sun during the hottest part of the day. I grow this for anyone who uses light meters, which I definitely, definitely recommend investing in. I grow this from about 200 to about 500 foot candles and it's really, really happy. They show signs of light stress really quickly. But the great thing I've noticed is that if you move it into slightly less light, the green will come back out in the leaf and you won't be left with an entirely green leaf. Now, if you do want to propagate it, you just need to stress it. So obviously, usually we try not to stress our plants and to get it to grow big, you get it on a pole and keep it stable. But to make it uh, procreate and create this runner, you can either allow it to dry right out or you can give it a real blast of, of pretty intense sun compared to what it's used to. And in response to that, it's gonna create this stall on, which is traveling across in the wild, traveling across the jungle floor to find a different place that's more suitable where it really wants to live. And when it gets there, it'll put a root down and it'll grow a whole new plant. Um, and along one stolon, you can get multiple nodes. So I've had them up to 40 or 50. And from each one of those, you can make 40 or 50 new plants. So it's a really good plant to propagate. And I'll always recommend whatever plant you have, especially the rarer plants, making a couple of them. So that if anything ever goes wrong with your, your main plant, you've always got a backup. So really important. Um, let it dry out between waterings in the wild they're damp but our houses are not that sort of situation we don't have the light we don't have the heat or the humidity so you just let it dry out in your home environment give it a good soak through and a really good feed every other watering and it'll put out leaves up to about 12 to 18 inches with these really really detailed fenestrations and the larger the leaves get the more filaments they get. And it's tiny, tiny little pieces of filament like this, almost ho just holding the leaf together. Um, so that has to be, I think, one of the most iconic plants in the last couple of years. It had its own hashtag. It went completely wild online. And I'm so happy that more people can actually enjoy this plant now. And I just, couldn't recommend it enough. <laughs> so that is um, what I'd like to refer to as one of my babies. Um, I'm going to just put it to the side because I've got something equally as exciting to show you as well. Another Monstera, which may look the same, but actually um, is a completely different species. So this here is the Monstera Adansonii mint, and this is the European mint. Um, on the market, you've got one from Indonesia, which has longer, um, narrower leaves and with a different pat pattern across it. But the European form has a really uniform pattern of flecked variegation. And this one is desperate to go onto a pole and grow nice and big. Um, I have one of these at home that initially I propagated because I wanted to make lots and lots of them. But I've left one of them now to grow and it is probably maybe about this big, about six foot, maybe a little bigger than me. Um, and the leaves get really big and beautiful. And with this pattern of variegation on them, they look phenomenal. Now this plant I've noticed is one of the hungriest feeders that I've ever, ever had. And sometimes because it's in the greenhouse, I feed this with every single watering. Um, it's another one that's easy to propagate. And the great thing 
that I've learnt with this plant is that if you chop the top it actually produces multiple side shoots so you can almost create a bush of Monstera oblique if you don't have the space to allow it to grow really tall. Um, the variegation on this is stable so unlike things like the Albo, the Aurea, Adansonia, variegated Adansonii, this one's completely stable and I saw the I saw the plants out in the greenhouses and the variegation on them is really, really uniform across all the plants, which is so nice to see. And when I was doing the tour, I actually commented on it because I've seen lots of these around that have sort of very patchy or very weak variegation, but these are absolutely stunning plants and super, super healthy. So I, yeah, I really couldn't recommend that one enough. I know that they have um, a lot of other Monstera here and obviously we've got this really special one in here and Monstera are my real speciality at home I have around 30 species of Monstera all different types from variegated to non-variegated and maybe about 20 different clones of, of Oblica and these have to be two of my absolute favorites so I, I really couldn't recommend them for vigor for strength and for ease of care as well so with that um, I think we need to start talking about what might be under here. Um, it's a, I was really surprised to see it um, because there hasn't been a, a new form of variegation in Monstera and Sonii for a really long time. And this is really something different. It's going to be a love or a hate, and I absolutely love it um, because it's different and in a very strange way, almost a little twisted and a bit alternative and it's really refreshing, I think, to have something like that. So uh, I think I'll take this off now and give you a little, little look what's under. Um, so I think you're going to agree it is so unbelievably different. But when I was going around the greenhouses, they were talking about it being a Monstera adansonii. And I wanted to know what its family was, what it came from, where it mutated from because this was a mutation from one of the plants right here at plants.com. So it is only available right here. And if you actually look at the petioles on it, it tells you exactly which plant it came from or which Adansonii it came from. So you can see on here, the petioles are deciduous, which means um, they, they dry up and they're brown and crispy here. And that means its parent was this absolutely beautiful, Monstera adansonii SSP laniata. So that plant there is a mutation of this beauty. And although the leaves, I've been told, although the leaves when it is smaller are a little bit twisted, when it grows under the right care, it turns into something like this. So the leaves flatten out, get much larger. And I'm so excited to see one of these grown really well at home. I'm definitely gonna give it a try. And I feel a little competition coming on with who can grow one of these the best. And I think I have some friends that will definitely take me up on that challenge. And I think we can get you in to come back and talk yes. about it and tell us a little bit more about what's going on. Yeah, right. It's too cool, right? It's awesome. I really this do love it. This new Monstera. Um, we hope you guys are getting excited about this, uh, this one too. Um, who wouldn't want... Uh, completely unique and new Monstera yeah. and um, yeah so this is it <laughs> it's really cool yeah it's really great to be here with unveiling it to everyone for the absolute first time and even I didn't know what it was going to be yeah. and when it was sent to me I was like oh okay this is <laughs> really nice I love it and the challenge I, I love a challenge with plants and it's the same for a Monstera oblique when it's smaller it can be a little twisted and the mint also mm -hmm. But under the right conditions, these leaves get big, really fenestrated. So the whole, you'll get as many holes as this one behind. But with yeah. that amazing flecked pattern on, I think yes. it's... Can wow. you imagine if I you can grow on that big with that yeah, pattern? Yeah, wow. It's going to be amazing. Would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so I think we've got questions, right? Right. Yeah. Are we going to jump we into want, those? We want to close together uh, by yeah. answering some of your <laughs> questions you guys um, asked tonight during the live. Um, I'm taking it. I just yeah. moved it like this, <laughs> like it's coming with me. <laughs> I'm watching you. <laughs> so this one. Um, how do you uh, manage to grow your foliage so big? 
Yeah, so that is, that is my challenge. I challenge myself to grow the plants as big as possible. And for me, my collection is really not about numbers. It's about really narrowing down the plants that I really love and trying to grow them as big and beautiful as possible. Now, most things are not gonna be able to achieve the size that they get in the wild, but it doesn't stop me trying. Yeah. And the key with it is light. You have to provide the right amount of light. And, and to get there, you can either ask other growers who've had really great success with the light levels, because with every plant it's different. Yeah. Um, but you can also experiment yourself. Move the plant into slightly more light and do it really gradually. Um, move it into more light, let it acclimate for a month or so, see what the reaction is. The mm -hmm. best way to learn about your plants is to experiment with them. So yeah. that's the first thing, is getting the light right. And the second thing is feeding, which so many people forget about. Um, there's only so much nutrition a plant has got in here. Can you imagine being in a tiny little jar when it's used to spreading its roots through the jungle and trying to find as much nutrition in that pot to be yeah. able to grow? So right. when it, as it's growing, it needs the vitamins, the minerals um, to grow. So I feed every other watering with most plants. And if a plant is growing really big and really fast or even flowering, then I'd recommend going to every watering. Yeah. But making sure every so often you flush it through to remove excess salts and build up in the pot. But yeah, the key is nutrition and light. Yeah, okay, great tips. <laughs> Own for Monstera, get it on a pole as soon as possible. Yeah. They okay. need to be on a pole because as they climb in the wild, they're climbing and they gain the fenestrations to spread out over a larger surface area mm -hmm. to capture more light. Yeah. So if you do that, it's going to help you capture more light. It's yeah. going to get bigger. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the next one is, what is the rarest plant you own? Ooh, this is an interesting one. So I think the most rare plant that I own is not an aroid, very strangely. I collect aroids mainly, um, although I love orchids. And I think the rarest plant I own is, the, is an orchid called the Coriobas cordatus, AFF and it is uh, most likely extinct in the wild. Uh, it's lost from science, it hasn't been described, and it is really difficult to keep. That is a ch real challenge to keep. If we're looking at aroids and things people may recognize more, mm -hmm. um, it, I think it has to be the variegated gloriosum, which is uh, I've had since January, and I'm having an absolute ball growing that, and I'm gonna try and grow the leaves huge, oh, wow. big patches of variegation on. And then the other is the, one of my absolute favorite plants is the variegated Raphidophora tetrasperma. That's something I think a lot of people know me for um, because I grew it and shared it yeah. all around the world. And um, it has to be one of my favorites. Okay. <laughs> which, um, with which plant did you start your collection? Well, my collection, my collecting of plants started when I was, before I could walk. So I would always help my grandmother out. I would be stripped, before I could stand up, she'd put a chair on the bench and she'd put a belt around me and tie it to, um, tie me to the chair so I was propped up. <laughs> so, I mean, they were just regular sort of garden plants. Mm -hmm. um, but with collecting, and it's a plant I still have now, it was a Phalaenopsis orchid, a species Phalaenopsis orchid. And I was given it by my nana, by my grandmother, yeah. um, for my 16th birthday. And over 16 years later, I still have it. Oh, so that's a really that's special plant. That's a good plant. story. Well, like, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a really special plant. And your plant. grandma's also a plant lover. Then. Absolutely. Yeah. Both of my grandparents oh. are plant lovers, yeah. Nice. My um, Adansoni is only growing white leaves. What can I do? So that will be the, ver yeah, the variegated Adansonii is renowned for being quite unstable with its variegation, especially if it's propagated. So first thing I'd say is I was always really keen to chop a plant when it became too white or too green, but I've learned that just by leaving it and allowing it to continue growing, sometimes the plants right themselves. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I'd say leave it. After eight leaves, if you're still not getting any green in, cut it down a couple of nodes below where the last green leaf or, or, or half leaf or variegated leaf was, take it right back, all of that, don't throw it away, chop it into individual leaf cuttings. You might get more green out of those. Mm -hmm. And then you should get more green from the base again. 
So that's what I'd say. Okay. Some variegation can be controlled with light and with heat, but not enough experiments have been done to say this is what you should do. Okay, well, that's a great tip though. <laughs> um, tips for pest control. So a couple of years ago, I would have said, get as many chemicals as you can and spray them all over your home. And I have completely reversed that. I don't use pesticides, natural or synthetic at all. Um, and I actually don't use beneficial insects either. So for me, the easiest way to manage pests, and I say manage, mm -hmm. because I never aim to have a collection that's completely pest free, because long term, you're always gonna fail at that. Mm -hmm. Because you have open windows, you're bringing new plants in and out. Yeah. My aim is always to focus on the plant's health and a healthy plant in most circumstances will not be overcome by pests. If you are there once every couple of weeks, showering them down or wiping them down with a damp cloth, that's all you need to do. You're basically acting like a, like a predator would outside and you're getting rid and, uh, of the, of the uh, pests yeah. and not allowing the numbers to grow outside. So the key is regular maintenance, but you don't need chemicals. And I'd okay. really urge people to step away, step away from chemicals for sure, because okay. they, they damage the environment, damage water when it goes down the sink, aquatic life, bees, and, and it's really important outside and inside we, we can start stepping away from that, yeah. Okay, well that will help. <laughs> um, if you had a limited budget, what would be your drama plan project? Ooh, well, in the UK right now, with the, the cost of electricity and gas, yeah, we it have would the just be able here. to keep my greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. But yeah. unlimited budget would be to set up a really huge greenhouse with multiple zones with different temperatures and that is the dream that's yeah. that's that's what i want for sure that sounds um, amazing of course i'd also love to move back to asia where i lived for a while okay. and have because you can grow the plants outside yeah. <laughs> that is yeah. just a dream <laughs> and you can grow them huge yeah and really let them flourish but for now if i'm staying in the uk it would be to to create a, a greenhouse with okay multiple oh, that's also a really yeah. cool dream. <laughs> i think so yeah <laughs> Um, best care tips for anthuriums without a greenhouse? So, yeah, m most of my anthurium are in the greenhouse, absolutely. And people say, I can't grow them like that because I don't have a greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Inside my house, I don't add humidity. I don't add artificial light in most cases. Um, anthurium really actually quite like to dry out. They like oxygen. Most anthurium like oxygen around their roots because a lot of them are hemiphytic or epiph epiphytes on trees so they're used to have an airflow around the roots so i grow mine in moss mm -hmm. pure moss and i grow it in terracotta which is, allows lots and lots of airflow through the pot yeah. the key is to get your watering just right because anthurium as they emerge they emerge as a almost fully formed small leaf and then they just start expanding so you need to make sure during that time the watering schedule it's not too wet and it's it doesn't dry out too much okay because as it's growing it requires so much water and as well as water it requires a lot of nutrients so when i see a new leaf starting to emerge on my anthurium i up the feeding to every watering yeah and then every probably fourth watering i'll rinse it through with clean water okay so yeah plenty of nutrition stable variegate uh, stable variegation stable watering schedule and um enough light yeah it's the same as most plants how to get them it, there, there's no big secret into growing plants successfully give them exactly what they need mm -hmm. light food yeah and they're gonna grow okay don't need to overcomplicate it you don't need cabinets or anything like that okay just keep it simple keep it simple and then it doesn't become overwhelming for you mm -hmm. And then you're more likely to enjoy the plant, give it the right care rather than stressing and overwatering it or yeah. thinking, I can't be bothered with this plant anymore. It's causing me too much stress and just sort of leaving it, which we've absolutely all done. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Um, can you change from rainwater to top water? Yes. Yes. I've just, I have just, I've just been writing about this. I use tap water on everything yeah. apart from carnivorous plants. I do it's, the same. I, have, I live in an area with the hardest water in the UK. It is, you do get, you get build up, you know, the mm -hmm. white build up. Yeah. But still the plants are absolutely fine. The effort it takes to get 
Um, spring water, I mean, spring water for plants is insane. I don't even drink spring water myself. I'm not going to give it to my plants. No, no. Um, and you can do reverse osmosis, which is great commercially, but on a small scale, it's, it's insane to me that you do that. They don't need it okay. at all. <laughs> you do okay. not need to, you don't need it. You don't need rainwater. Um, no. Okay. So that's a clear answer. <laughs> yeah, it's a very clear answer. <laughs> oh, and also chlorine. Chlorine is, is some people think chlorine is the mm -hmm. devil for plants, but chlorine is absolutely necessary. It's one of the vital elements that plants need for successful growth. Okay. So, and actually helps them create larger structures. So they need chlorine. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so these were the questions that were sent in uh, beforehand. Mm -hmm. And now we also have some questions that you guys asked tonight. Ooh, what have we got? I have them here. <laughs> no, um, you can't have my number. <laughs> um, no, I'm not available. Um, <laughs> joking. So the first one is, I don't like the look of a moss pole. How can I give my monstera support in a different way? Emotional support or? <laughs> no, no, okay. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've tried various things and what we call moss poles usually are coir poles. These here, they're made from, um, from dried coir fiber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the biggest fan of those, although when you grow something well, it sort of covers it so you don't see it. Um, so first of all, if you didn't use moss, like actual moss, I'd say try a pole made of pure natural sphagnum moss. Mm -hmm. And you can do it without having a, like a cage around it. So what I do, especially with smaller plants, is I take a wooden pole and I hold the sphagnum moss around it like a sausage roll. And then I just use string and wrap it really tight around. And then you get a completely natural structure. Mm -hmm. um, you can also use um, a natural um, branch if you like the look of that. Or the, I think there is, um, in fact, there is, a more ecological alternative to these coming out. It's just starting to come out into the UK, I know, and I'm sure it's in, in uh, Europe too. And it's made from potato starch. So it's biodegradable, much more eco-friendly. It's made from a giant grass and p potato starch. Okay. And I think they look much better. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we also have the Casper Moss Pole, and it is a um, uh, pole made of recycled plastic, mm -hmm. and you can do your sphagnum moss in it. Ah, and so you can put any substrate inside yeah, it. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any those. substrate you like. Yeah, so nice. That's also a good one. Um, the next question, how did, you, how did your love for plants mm. start? Can you describe your journey? Grandparents, I mean, um, they are my absolute inspiration. I wouldn't be where I am today without them really nurturing my love, not just for plants, but just for the natural world. Mm -hmm. I was allowed to do whatever I wanted with them as a kid. I had like hedgehogs in my bedroom, ducks, um, lizards, everything. And that all works together with just enjoying the natural world. And they just allowed that and they fed it and they allowed me the space and let me make a mess. And um, that's just, just been with me all, mm -hmm. all, through, all through my life. And, and I do things now like my propagating room at home, I, I, I was writing and discovered that I've basically recreated what we used to have at home, this really sort of warm, humid propagating room where I do all my laundry, but it's perfect for the plants too, because it's yeah. really warm and really humid. <laughs> and that's where I spent most of my childhood with my grandparents in that room, and I've yeah. sort of created one now. <laughs> that's such a good story. Yeah, it's yeah, really it's nice. Really nice. <laughs> yeah. Don't cry. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the third one is tips for fertilizing plants. Mm -hmm. When, how, what? So, I have a brand of fertilizer, so I know a little bit about this. Um, just a little bit. It is so vitally important, first of all, to fertilize. And it's also really important not to just use, if you want maximum growth, it's really important to use synthetic fertilizer. You can use natural. Um, and natural give, gives a slow release, um, slower sort of benefit to the plants and helps uh, soil microbiology. But the thing with, with uh, natural fertilizers is that the plant cannot absorb them. The, plant, uh, the fertilizers need to be broken down by bacteria in the soil and then fed to the plant. That's, that's a sort of very basic way to put it. Synthetic fertilizers are um, formulated for the plants to just absorb them as soon as it gets in there, they can take them up. Mm -hmm. And that can result in really fast, really rapid growth. 
um, when to do it all year round if your plants are growing. Mm -hmm. And people ask me about winter, but in general, if a plant's getting enough light, it doesn't know it's winter outside because it doesn't, it can't watch the news. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it can't go outside to check what the weather's like. Yeah. It's living inside. Um, so I fertilize all year round, every other watering for most plants, um, things like cacti and orchids are different, but in general, most leafy house plants, um, every other watering. Okay. The last one, can you mm -hmm. show the new monstera in a close-up? Oh, okay. Shall I come in? I absolutely, I love the variegation and I see it as an absolute challenge to get these leaves to flatten out and be a lot bigger. But the flecked variegation is absolutely spectacular. I really do love it. It's really special. Yeah, and completely stable as well. Mm -hmm. I'll put it there because it's special. It's out the front. Yeah. <laughs> so these were the questions. Um, thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thanks for coming here to uh, host this Plants Live with it's us. It's been an absolute joy. I hope everyone enjoyed it. <laughs> we love that you shared so much information with us and um, how cool that your own book will launch soon. Yes, yeah. We can't I, wait. <laughs> I can't wait for that either. <laughs> so you're right. My book, in fact, today's a really special day because I just signed off the final, 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 final words and made the final, final little tweaks and just pressed the send button before um, we came on live. So my book launches in April next year. It's all about a lot of these rarer, unusual plants. And not only does it tell you how to do things, it explains why we're doing them. So you get a really deep understanding and appreciation of your plants. And one of the key things I do in the book is explain a lot of these processes your plants are doing without you even knowing. And for me, even writing the book has made me fall so much more in love and be more inspired by plants. So I, I can't wait for everyone to, to, yeah. to read it. I'm, I'm really excited and you guys are gonna have it. Oh, so wow. I am mega excited. Yeah, cool. We can't wait to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so um, I would like to remind you that our discount code PLANTSLIFE15 will give you 15% off of everything in our shop. Um, so don't wait, fill up your shopping cart with all your favorite plants items and the code is valid until midnight. Um, I also would like to say that this is just the beginning of Plants Week. Um, this Plants Week we have amazing um, new promotions every day. So keep an eye on our socials, website and emails and don't miss a single one. Um, thanks for watching. We hope you liked as much as we did. And Tony, again, thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. <laughs> it was really nice. And can I just say, come and follow me on Instagram. It's not yes. another jungle, not on anything else. Just come on Instagram <laughs> and I'll see you very soon. Yes. Bye. Um, enjoy shopping, you guys. Um, enjoy the next uh, plant week. Have a nice evening. And we hope to see you all again next time. Bye.